Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, thanks for that great introduction. Um, I'm going to show you some slides here that I hope will uh, fill you in on some of the structures, the ways that we have come to to live and eat and shop. Uh, there are a lot of very interconnected things, so these slides will bring up a lot of questions I'm sure that we can also talk about uh, when we get through it. So the title of this talk is uh, Super Highways, Subdivisions, and GMOs in Environmental Humanities Look at the Way Americans Eat. So those of you who've been here for a couple of days have probably heard quite a bit about this question, are GMOs uh, a threat to human health? Uh, most scientists say no, uh, as you've heard many times over the course of the last few days, there's quite a bit of controversy about this question among non-scientists. Uh, but for my purposes, I'm really interested in things that are beyond that. We can talk about whether eating a genetically modified plant is more or less unhealthy than eating a regular plant later, if you like. But I'm interested in questions that are actually, I think are actually bigger than that. So a little bit of background. Ooh, that doesn't look quite right. Uh, what that says is after World War II, the American landscape underwent a radical transformation. So you have to remember that uh, the world experiences great trauma in Europe during World War II. And we had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of soldiers over there fighting. And we lost a lot of people. Uh, one thing we decided to do, having been over there, is we took a look at the Audubon system of highways that had allowed uh, Germany to move troops and vehicles all over Europe in a very efficient manner, which allowed them to uh, do the damage they did. So we decided to follow suit and create a highway system in the United States. Now, this may not be immediately apparent to you, but if you drive on the interstates, occasionally you will see a sign that says the Eisenhower Interstate System. And you, the little emblem is a, is a circle of five stars. The circle of five stars are there to represent the five stars that Dwight Eisenhower had when he was the commanding officer of the Allied forces in Europe. So we built this system of highways w in what we would now call a system of homeland security. The idea was the highways would allow us to defend ourselves if we were ever invaded. That's why the highways were built. Now you might be thinking, what does that have to do with our food system? Well, this is what the highway network looks like now. Those of us on the East Coast are very familiar with roads like I-95, which I drive on every single day from my home in Baltimore to my university in Delaware, up and down, up and down, up and down. But you can drive from Maine to Florida on 95. Along the way, you're going to hit a lot of intersections like those you see up there, big beltways around the big cities, beltways around Boston, beltways around Philadelphia, beltways around Baltimore or Washington or Richmond, big, big, fast, safe wide roads. Right now, the interstate highway system is around 47,000 miles long. And that's only the interstates, the federal highways. That does not include the smaller roads, the state roads, little county roads. That's just the big highways. What that meant was when all these soldiers came back from the war, they used to live in the city. The United States used to be cities surrounded by farms. That's the way Europe Bless you, uh, Europe still is. Europe is still cities surrounded by farms, largely. Europe never suburbanized, but we did something different. It used to be that you'd talk to guys, people, you know, your, maybe your grandparents' age, that said they wanted to move out into the country, build houses in the country. What the country meant was building houses outside the city. Uh, what that country was, was farmland. So I live in Maryland, which is, by comparison to New York, uh, quite a small state. But even in the little state of Maryland, we've lost a million acres of forest uh, and farmland over the last couple of decades. Uh, you know, the joke about the East Coast is that farms no longer grow food, they grow houses. So any, all of us, you know, you live on Long Island, you certainly have experienced that with, uh, I mean, one of the first Levittowns was out here. Uh, this place used to be one of the great uh, centers of potato farms. Now it's all subdivisions and suburbs. So that's, that's what we've grown up with. That's what we've come to know and come, come to expect. That is fine as far as it goes. We've got lots of nice places to live and nice places to shop. But what we don't have is a lot of nice places to grow food. So uh, since the 1930s, in the, in the United States, we've lost 4 million small farms. Now, we all know stories of the farmer who could no longer pay his bills, so he sold out to a developer because he could get a big fat check, sell his farm, developer comes in, plows it over, and paves it, builds a bunch of houses. 
the joke I always think of is that, that subdivisions are named for the things that were destroyed to make them. So just take a look anytime you pass by a big division, subdivision and see what it's called. So that's one thing I want you to keep in mind. The disappearance of farmland. Coincidental with that were companies that used to make chemicals for uh, warfare often to make explosives or things like defoliants if you were fighting in a jungle. Uh, suddenly, the wars were over and they had to find new things to make with their products. Turns out that these petrochemical companies can make a lot of stuff. What that says, it's a little cut off at the top. Uh, with all these new houses to fill, consumerism grew into a national obsession. This is the world we live in now where we have been shopping for about 50 years. Lots of companies will make just about anything we want. Chemical companies make the ingredients to produce around 70,000 different products. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but let's say that one of those products is plastic water bottles. And there are billions and billions and billions of plastic water bottles. But they can make everything. Uh, they're about a $637 billion industry right now. Walk into any big box shopping mall and you'll see what I'm talking about. In fact, we could look around this room and point to something here that is not made out of petrochemicals. Like, I'm not seeing a whole lot. Like, even the chair, I don't know if the chairs you're sitting in are, have metal in them. I guess they have a little bit of metal. That's probably not a petrochemical. But certainly the upholstery is, and the carpeting is, and the acoustic tile is, and the paint is, and the, you know, the, uh, the drywall is, and everything else is. Your clothing is. Your cosmetics are, just to begin with. So we buy a lot of stuff, and companies make a lot of stuff. But we didn't really stop to think ever, because we were so happy buying all this stuff, what the consequences were of living this way. So turning local farms into subdivisions meant tectonic changes, both in the scale of our material wants and in the way we eat. So now, instead of living in a small apartment in the city, we live in a four or 5,000 square foot house in, the house in the suburbs. We've got to fill it up with stuff. Fill it up with carpeting and furniture and everything else. So what we do is we create shopping malls where we can buy anything we want 24 hours a day. Now, I happen to be interested in both health and environmental things. If you're looking at those images in terms of health, we'll talk about what kinds of impacts these products have on our health, but also don't forget that that is land that used to be a forest or it used to be a farm, now it's a parking lot. This means anytime it rains, everything on those parking lots is going into your drinking water. It means that whatever the soil condition was like underneath there is now buried under concrete. It means that there are no trees acting as carbon sinks for climate change. There's like, just those images alone are really, uh, you know, impactful on what's happened with our land. So we started filling our houses with all this stuff and we started filling all our bellies with industrial food. So this book, Contamination, is the one uh, that came out a couple of years ago about the health consequences of buying stuff and then living with it and all the ways that it impacts uh, our hormonal systems, our reproductive systems, our neurological systems, all that sort of thing. That's less what I'm talking about today, although I'm happy to answer questions about that. I'm more interested in the food product. Uh, you know, we think about the people who are supposed to be out there uh, protecting us from all this, and we think naturally either the companies are making sure that we're safe or the government is somehow making us safe. Uh, this book, Poison Spring, uh, was ri written with this guy, uh, E.G. Valianatos, who used to work at the EPA, and he's sitting there uh, inside the EPA for 25 years collecting documents to show how uh, powerful corporations are at dictating regulatory agencies and how ineffective these agencies are, in fact, at, at protecting us from anything. Really, what they're doing is to working to support industry. So the new book is called Food Fight, GMOs and the Future of the American Diet, and this is a logical outgrowth of everything we've been talking about because GMOs, genetically modified organism, organisms, are seeds that are engineered by the same companies that make the chemicals that get sprayed on these, these products, these, these plants. So this is all of a piece. It's all of a piece of allowing the consolidation of production and economic and political power in the hands of a very few number of companies. 
So inside the malls, you can find lots and lots of products. Some of them have labels on them, most of them don't. The ones that do have labels occasionally will tell you that it is carcinogenic. Like every now and then you'll pick up something and say, have a label on it says, this product is known to be cause cancer. And usually it'll say, in the state of California. Because California has much tighter regulations than everybody else. The joke is, you know, if it causes cancer in California, it probably causes cancer in New York too, you know. But we don't have a label, we're not required to put a label on it. Uh, the thing about the labeling is that the same ingredients can be in other products without a label. So for example, you can find products in the cosmetics aisle that have the same carcinogenic ingredients as other things, but there's no label because the cosmetics industry has worked it in such a way that they are not required to put a label on it. So one question is, why would you want to label something that you put on your car's engine and not something that you put on your face? That tells you something about the way politics works, the way corporations are able to influence policy. The three largest users of the pink ribbon label on cosmetics, Avon, Estee Lauder, and Revlon, remain unwilling to sign a pledge to remove carcinogens from their products. You've heard of something called pink washing. Just because something has a pink label on it does not mean you should buy it. I've become very cynical about the pink ribbon when you see football players wearing pink cleats or baseball players carrying pink bats. I know it's sending a message. I'm just not totally sure I know what the message is. Lawn chemicals, uh, lawn care companies love to advertise uh, happy children and happy pets playing on grass. But lawn chemicals have been tied to a lot of different problems, uh, both in human and animal health. Uh, I, I, of all the things I've written about, I, I tend to be evangelical about a few of them, and one of them is about lawn chemicals. You should basically stop using lawn chemicals. Just stop using them. You don't need them. Uh, they are. N you have to ask yourself what you're doing it for. If you're spraying herbicides on your lawn to kill clover, this is a very bad idea because clover is a perfectly happy little plant. It doesn't impact you. It doesn't hurt your feet. What it does is it feeds bees, which we desperately need because we're losing bees all over the place. Uh, clover also happens to be a, what's called a nitrogen fixer. It takes this nitrogen out of the atmosphere and puts it in the soil. And if you get rid of your clover, now you have to buy fertilizer. So instead of buying zero products, now you have to buy two. So save yourself some money, do the environment a good, a good deed, and do your health a good deed, and just don't buy any of this stuff. Don't fall victim to the advertising that is trying to convince you that you need this stuff. Most of the things we're talking about today you actually don't need. In fact, you need very little of it.